Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, March 22nd meeting of the full Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting. And at this time, I'd like to call on Commissioner Brad Box to give the invocation and the pledge, please. Let's pray. Father God, you're good to us. Uh, we give you praise and thanks for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for all the ways that we see you and feel your peace through the wildlife and the natural beauty of our state. We realize that each one of us is merely a interim steward of this amazing gift. And we ask that you guide us with your wisdom in everything that we do and everything that we say, that it would be pleasing to you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Box. Uh, I'd like to welcome our guests today. We got Mr. Mike Butler, Ms. J.W. Worthen, Ms. Ashley Tone. Ms. Jeb Beasley, KC Moat, all from the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Welcome. Gabby Wortham, I assume that you're here with JW. And uh, Clarence and Laura Dye, I'm glad y'all made it back. You know, we, we got you on a little double secret probation, but we're glad you're back today. <laughs> we, we appreciate it. Uh, commissioners, you've been provided a copy of the minutes, and the chair would entertain a motion for approval. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Cox. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, let's see. As we begin the new commission year, I want to take a moment for the record just to introduce, you know, we we, we do a lot up here. I, I know this commission works really hard and, and our information is on the website, but uh, I think it's important that the, the public and, and a lot of the staff that might not know all our commissioners uh, – know who they are and put a name with the face and, and what they do. I'll start with uh, Commissioner Devaney, who's our vice chair this year, and he's at home recovering from a little bout of pneumonia. So we wish Chris well, but Chris is, comes to us from the Chattanooga area and just does a wonderful job and, and his communication skills are very helpful to the commission. Greg Davenport is from the Brentwood area. Greg comes to us uh, as a very talented engineer and is our serving this year as our secretary. And we appreciate his, his knowledge and his expertise in hunting and fishing. Commissioner Tommy Woods, who is most recently our chairman last year. Tommy, welcome back today. We missed you yesterday. And uh, we all know Tommy's leadership skills and what he brings to this commission and his dedication to the, to the resource. Rhonda Moody comes to us from, uh, Allard or Jamestown or wherever. I can't ever keep it straight. She's got so many, but Rhonda's uh, and her wife and her husband, Fred, uh, run a wonderful quail plantation in uh, up in, in the uh, Allard area. And they have a winery, the oldest winery in Tennessee. And so their, their expertise in hunting and fishing and what goes on in this state is, is, is really good. Stan Butt comes to us from down in the Columbia area. Stan is uh, married to Sheila, who's the mayor of, of Maury County and Stan's expertise. Every time he he talks, he's his 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 expertise in so many areas is 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 unbelievable, and he brings a wealth of knowledge to this commission. And I think it's uh, it's it's obvious when he when he's in conversation. Monty Ballou, Monty's uh, comes to us from up in the Paris area, and his his years and years of expertise in uh, in the law enforcement area is just unprecedented, and so. 250 of our 750 employees are law enforcement. So obviously Monty brings a, a great expertise in that area. Commissioner Box on my right. Uh, Brad comes from the Jackson area. His wife is former chairman and uh, his legal mind and his expertise in hunting and fishing is, is wonderful. And he's uh, obviously a, a huge uh, advocate for education. He's on the UT board of of trust and he's just exposed us to so much and it brings so much to this this agency. 
Commissioner Hank Wright is a veterinarian from the Memphis area, and obviously we're dealing with CWD and avian flu, and so his his expertise in those arenas is is really a, uh, a vital help to this uh, this agency, and we appreciate everything that Hank does. Commissioner Childress on my right, Wally is a huge farmer down in the Bogota area, but his his love of children and what he does in the R3 arena is is spectacular with I mean, he hunts 60 straight days unless his wife makes him stay home for at least one day. To, but the, the kids, the, the, the veterans, the Farm Bureau folks, I mean, he's just so generous of his time and expertise in hunting. And I always call him, I, I want to be a farmer, but the government won't appoint me a farmer yet. But Wally says I should be, but he helped very helpful in me and my little farm in, in the Dixon County area. Commissioner Cox on my right, uh, Bill's got – a tremendous uh, amount of institutional knowledge in this agency. He's been a commissioner for almost 20 years in three different terms. And his, uh, his uh, tenacity on the budget is just really important as we work through all the issues of what, what's going on with, with our budget. Uh, commissioner Saltzman couldn't be with us today, but Chip's uh, a, a huge out, outdoorsman, huge waterfowl hunter, and, and he brings a tremendous amount of political expertise. And uh, he doesn't say much, but when he does, it's a very on-point uh, comment. So that's very helpful, and we wish Chip well today. Sorry he couldn't be with us. Governor Lee's ex officio. He's not here today, obviously, but uh, we, we appreciate what he does for this state and this agency. Charlie Hatcher is our agricultural commissioner. and He's appointed Jeff Aiken and his representative. Jeff, we appreciate everything you bring to the table for this, for this agency. And then, of course, uh, Chuck Yost, who is the appointee of the TDAC commissioner. Chuck, we appreciate your your knowledge and expertise. And, and we're getting these guys involved with our, our committee uh, uh, stuff this year. And then, finally, uh, our newest commissioner everybody met yesterday is Ford Little. He's on the far left. And Ford uh, is what 24 hours into being a commissioner, and he's he's already done the long range shooting, and he's already been thrown in the fire on a lot of really important issues. And we appreciate Ford's uh, ten you know uh, time on this commission, and we hope he uh, enjoys it as much as we do, and and what we uh, do for this this commission. It's a it's a very high paying job, as you know, and uh, and uh, but and and that's a really. A, a, a joking point, but everybody at this table puts a lot of their own time and money into this job. And, and we do it for the right reasons, because I think we all love this resource and what this agency does as much as all the 750 employees do across the, uh, across the state. So, um, and it's, I'm Jimmy Granberry and I'm honored to serve this year as, as your chairman and, uh, look forward to it. I've got some big shoes to fill with, with Tommy Woods, but I'll, uh, do my best to uh, to fill those shoes. I want to take a point to thank uh, Mr. Tom Beasley was our guest last night. We're at the Beasley Buffalo Ridge Refuge, and for not for Tom Beasley, we probably wouldn't be here. And 81 years old uh, came and spent four hours with us, and we just had a wonderful time uh, hearing the stories and you know talking to to Mr. Beasley. And he was. He was thrilled. He emailed me last night to say how thankful he was about the expertise, the enthusiasm of what this commission and what this agency is doing. And he's, uh, he's very happy that this property is here uh, and, and what we're doing. Thank Jan and Earl Bentz for their hosting us uh, Wednesday night at a wonderful dinner at Earl's Farm north of here. Everybody knows the Earl Bentz story and what he's meant to this agency from, you know, the being a commissioner to four boat manufacturers and his love for the outdoors. So we thank uh, Jan and Earl. And, and then um, finally, most importantly, thank the staff of Buffalo Ridge for every time we come down here, everything's organized, everything's neat, everything's up to date. And we just really appreciate uh, <clears throat> your hospitality. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Maxidon and uh, and you can add anything to it. But again, thank you to the staff at Buffalo Ridge. I think we left Okay, he didn't, he didn't, I'm sorry, Horace Tipton? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Horace Tipton's another guest. Thank you for being here. Sorry you didn't sign in on the list, and but uh, welcome. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you can see, the chairman is going to be a great leader, and we're going to have a busy year. He has a great memory, and thank you for recognizing all the commissioners there. I want to start this morning by recognizing our wildlife officers. And Scott, if you'll, 
you'll pop that first slide up. I'd appreciate it. But these are officers in Middle Tennessee who are training police and deputies throughout the state in seated field sobriety tests. Our methods of testing are just a little bit different, obviously, because we're doing that on the water and we have to do that from a seated position. These are standardized and validated, and these tests are used by wildlife officers to determine if boaters are operating a vessel under the influence while in a patrol boat. These tests are highly sought after, uh, not only by law enforcement on the water, but also by highway patrol and road troopers. Um, and it's for the ability to test motor vehicle operators who are suspect, suspected of DUI that may have considerations that would eliminate the use of standard field sobriety tests. As you can see here, the Gallatin PD hosted 23 officers from 12 different departments and TWA instructors delivered some exceptional training. So thank you to our officers for doing that. Our officers are some of the best and most well-trained officers in the state. Uh, many of you may not realize, but we assist in a lot of other things in body recoveries, uh, manhunts, searches, search and rescue. Um, anytime there's a natural disaster, our folks are going out because of the equipment and the tools that we have to be able to assist with all these. Uh, there's a very unique skill set. Uh, we have officers that are actually just behind us over here. They're actually being trained as we speak. We have a cadet class that's over there right now, and they'll be going home today, but they're over there getting this training now. I'm always proud of the work that our staff do across the state. And this month, we're also excited to be welcoming, welcoming several brand new staff members um, from, that manage statewide programs. Um, but before I introduce the new folks, I want to start by sharing a promotion. As you all know, Jason Henniger recently promoted to Fisheries Division Chief, and today we're going to be announcing his replacement where he was Assistant Chief. Um, Region 3 Program Manager Travis Scott has been promoted to Assistant Chief. He's been a strong leader in the Fisheries Division, and Region 3, we know that he's going to excel at this new role as Assistant Chief. So now for the new folks. We're pleased to announce that Dr. Adam Edge is the new statewide deer program coordinator in the Wildlife and Forestry Division. Adam's not with us today, but he'll be joining us at the April meeting. So after graduating from Western Kentucky University with a degree in biology, Adam pursued, pursued his PhD at the University of Georgia. His work centered on fawn survival and modeling a declining deer population to better understand what management actions could be taken to improve productivity. He worked closely with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to integrate his research finding within their agency, um, part of their management efforts to gain direct experience working in complexities of public trust doctrine and divergent public interests. Before joining us, he's going to be wrapping up a position with the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study. He's been investigating turkey diseases there, which will be some benefit to us as well. Adam's also a sergeant in the Army National Guard, where he's gained formal leadership training that will suit him well to lead our deer team. So we're excited. Welcome aboard, Adam. I think he's watching today, so look forward to getting to see you in April. We have with us today, where's Miss Allie at? Miss Allison Spica, who's going to be joining as the new communications team. She's going to be our new marketing manager. I didn't see Allie. I think she's hiding behind the pole over there. Raise your hand, Allie. All right. So after graduating from Montana State University, she went on to build a design business, providing event planning, marketing, commercial interiors, and more for local clients, including Pheasants Forever and Safari Club International. Here in Tennessee, she gained experience in hospitality and event planning at the Gun Club of Tennessee and previously served as the marketing director for the Real Estate Investors Group of Nashville. She's been an active volunteer with the Music City Quail Forever and helped them grow attendance and support at their last banquet. So welcome aboard, Allie. Look forward to getting to see you work in this new role. We also have Daniel Musselwhite joining the outreach team as the new Wildlife Education Program Coordinator. He will be responsible for overseeing the property that we're at here today at Buffalo Ridge Refuge and statewide education and outreach programs. He comes to us from Alabama, where he's been a regional hunter education coordinator since 2015. In his 10 years with the agency there, he's developed and implemented shooting sports programs, training workshops, fostered partnerships to expand outreach efforts, managed staff shooting ranges with 15,000 shooters annually, and managed over 400 volunteer hunter education instructors, and coordinated NASP, which we talked about yesterday, the National Archery and Schools Program, regional and state events with over 5,000 participants. So we're excited to welcome all of these folks to the TWRA family. We're confident that their experiences and expertise will be valuable additions to the work that we do. So speaking of outreach, since we're here at Buffalo Ridge, today you're going to hear from partners at the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. So welcome. Mike's got a pretty big crew sitting back there. Thank you all for being here today. They're going to be talking about our three efforts through the Hunting and Fishing Academy that are critical to ensuring that hunters and anglers have skills and resources they need to get involved in the outdoors. 
they've been able to grow the program with the help of more virtual classes, and we're proud to support these efforts with the Federation. As you all are going to hear, you're going to see more from them here in just a minute. There's going to be more and more that the data is showing that recreational shooters are becoming one of our biggest funding sources through the Federal Wildlife Restoration Act dollars. You saw yesterday through Deputy Fiss's, Fiss's, Deputy Fiss's delivery of that, and you're going to see it again today. I got to get that out there just right, um, that much of that PR dollars that's matched to those programs, and they're going to be talking about some of that today. So the Federation does a great job getting those young people started in the program so that they can get excited about shooting, and then they learn more about other opportunities that we offer. So TWR invests heavily in these programs, um, also involving the youth. So hopefully you enjoy hearing more about the dollars and how these work for sportsmen and sportswomen. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Director. And um, I was just, this was a test and only Bill caught it. He's got so much institutional knowledge. Mr. Mayor, would you please call the roll? I'm going to give you. They're trying to fight over who actually caught it. But anyway, Ms. Mayor, please call the roll. <laughs> well, okay. So, he who speaks last wins. You, you got it, Stan. <laughs> Bring him a Twinkie, please. <laughs> Monty Blue. Uh, here. Brad Box. Here. Stan Butt. Here. Wally Childress. Here. Bill Cox. Here. Greg Davenport. Here. Chris Devaney. Ford Little. Here. Rhonda Moody. Here. Chip Salsman. Tommy Woods. Here. Hank Wright. Here. Jimmy Granberry. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Mary. Um, commissioners, are there any announcements or points of privilege before we get started? Yeah, I've got one. If you hadn't gotten notice, I think you will. The governor's one-shot turkey hunt that the foundation puts on is coming up uh, in April. Uh, 13th. 13th, thank you. And I think everybody that <laughs> likes the turkey hunt, ought to, it's a big fundraiser for them, and it's a really a lot of fun, and I hope you try to try to attend. Thank you, Mr. Cox. So I, I have one point of privilege here. Allie, if with your resume and your uh, interior decorating, your first job is going to be to fix the carpet in the big conference room at, at uh, Ellington Agriculture Center. Uh, that purple carpet in my uh, and our, uh, our uh, agency dog, Charlotte, and the white hair just don't mix. So we, we've got to figure that out. So that's a tough Tough charge, but we'll uh, we think you can handle that uh, challenge. So, all right, thanks. Uh, moving the agenda, I'd like to call Lieutenant Colonel Gr uh, Dale Grandstaff to the podium, please, for a presentation. Am I on? All right. Thank you, Chairman Granberry. We we did notice the hair in there. We were doing a meeting a few weeks ago. <laughs> but I agree with your assessment of the carpet. No, we did an investigation and we came up with that conclusion that it was your dog. <laughs> uh, yesterday we were. I'm gonna I'm gonna start this off with uh, on the way here yesterday, uh, before we have our next meeting, turkey seasonal kickoff and. On my way here yesterday, I'm coming through Houston County and right in the middle of the road, I had to come to a complete stop. If you would hit the video for me. Came to a complete stop and let them pass in front of me, but they were just real close and gobbled for me when I took a video of them. I just wanted to get everybody fired up for turkey season. So uh, <laughs> yesterday, um, Chairman Wright, or, uh, Chairman Wright of the Wildlife Committee tasked us with uh, looking at a hunting season, night hunting sports season for uh, coyote um, and bobcat. I think that was mentioned. And so last night, uh, changing or creating a season like this isn't easy. It's uh, once you start the process, you have to look at, does it affect this? Does it affect that? And it does. When you create a season, there's going to be things that you don't think about. Uh, so last night, um, with wildlife division, uh, law enforcement, uh, licensing, legal. We all sat back here last night late working on this and kind of going over it and, and try to come up with something that we thought was workable. It's not complete, uh, but it will be uh, a starting point 
that we can talk about today and then and, and answer any questions that we can. Uh, have Colonel Ryder on standby right there and uh, Joe Benedict kind of available if we need some questions and answers. I'm not going to have all the answers because uh, it's going to be a, a, a sort of a figure it out as we go over these next few moments and in the next few months we'll work on it. Um, so with that, last night, here's what we came up with last night, a night coyote and bobcat season, private land only. I'll go through it and then we'll go back and kind of talk about it, about it piece by piece. The, the parts that are in yellow are things that we really need to discuss. And we've discussed it since last night and came up with a few other uh, um, uh, changes to it. And I'll mention those in a moment. Season dates. It'll open the day after deer season, uh, the end of deer season through March 15th. Open the day after the end of deer season through March 15th. And then it'll reopen June 1 through August 15th. The hours, we've discussed the hours again. Most likely that needs to be 30 minutes before or after sunset until 30 minutes before sunrise is what that probably should look like. Um, so we'll make that change right there. Bag limit, bobcat, one per night from sunset to from 30 minutes before after sunset to 30 minutes before sunrise. Uh, coyote, no limit. License type, that's a, a debate to talk about or question to, to go over. Um, allowed on this hunt. Lights allowed, not from or attached to a mechanized vehicle or cast from a public road. Night vision allowed and thermal imaging equipment. Hand, mouth operated and electronic calls that imitate wounded prey or coyote calls would be allowed. Weapons allowed. Shotguns only, no single projectile. Shot size, we've got it in yellow because there was we, we went back and forth of what we should really be using. So in discussing it with Colonel Ryder, we I probably would ask him to come up and discuss that. Let's go ahead and discuss the shot size uh, because we're thinking probably shotgun only single project, no single projectiles would be the cleanest and easiest. If you would, Colonel Ryder, just kind of briefly discuss what we had looked at on that. Yeah, so in looking at this and you start looking at the uh, ammunition manufacturers, your Hornady's, your Remington's, your Federal's, your Winchester's, and Heavy Shot, they produce a product that's specifically designed for varmint or coyote hunting. And, and most of what we see is they start, the bulk of it is number four buck. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. And then a couple of those are double op buck. So that's kind of where we're thinking to allow this ammunition and try to keep that safety mechanism in our, in our, in our conscious, I think we would probably look at going to uh, no single projectiles and shotguns, which would be your slugs. If that makes sense. The buckshot's good. Okay. Yes, sir. It's not a single projectile. There's like, I don't know, uh, eight or nine buckshot per round, roughly and like number four bucks for the most part, or got 32 pellets in a round. And so, yeah, buckshot would be okay. And so with those explanations, um, I guess we'll go back up and start with the uh, season dates and start discussion with it, if that's what uh, uh, Chairman Wright, if that's uh, what you would prefer right now. I'd like to hear comments from anyone on the commission that has comments, but I, I like the the movement towards single projectile only because a lot of the commercial loads for coyotes do contain other shot sizes that are larger than triple T. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'd like to, um, I'd like for us to consider between now and, and the April meeting during this preview period, you know, some sort of permit process. Um, I think it'd be great to know who's out doing this, you know, to, for us to have some way to track these, uh, maybe there's a safety video uh, accompanies that, but I'd love to have some sort of, if we could look into a permit process for this, I think it'd be smart. So, uh, Commissioner Wright, uh, I'll just turn it over to the rest of the commission yeah. to uh, ask questions of, of, of Lieutenant Colonel. Commissioner Wood. So how would this affect the current deprivation component of nighttime coyote hunting? Well, 
we discussed that that 70 4 115 allows you to depredate if there are is legitimate property damage and we know that that's going on we know that um that there are landowners that have legitimate property damage that are protecting their property but this will allow someone to get permission on anyone's property that don't have that type of damage. They just want to go out and have a new season, a new sports season to hunt. Um, so it's a little different. They can still depredate if that's, if, the, if it's legitimate depredation that is still available to them. So depredation would, these rules would not apply to deprivation. <laughs> during this, during this season, um, if there is depredation that needs to happen, they could still depredate, but this is a, is a specific time frame, specific season, uh, that this equipment would be allowed during the season. And, and a good point is this is going to require a hunting license and a depredation does not. So again, <clears throat> would deprivation would they have to follow the, these particular rules as far as shot size single projectile uh the the season itself um so forth so on if they're depredating they can still follow the guides the guidelines of depredation so but it needs to be legitimate depredation for a legitimate reason so I'm raising quail on my property and I've determined that the coyotes are coming in and eating my quail. Am I okay to bring folks in to shoot coyotes at night? If those are your pen raised quail that you, you've got on your property, I say yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I have great concern if we allow the public just to start this but if we follow the guidelines that have been suggested here i i would like to see in place that those who are doing the night hunting have to have written permission on their person uh if if they are checked it's going to add in my opinion it's going to add additional responsibility to all our le's uh, who are already challenged with a lot of things going, and that's a concern to me. Uh, also, it's of concern with those who are less informed or less uh, educated as far as firearms. I'm afraid that we're going to uh, have a lot of farmer's dogs and, and, and a lot of other things that, that are potentially uh, would be taken, and so... Uh, I think we're moving into uncharted territory here. Although I'm not against it, I, I have great uh, reservations about uh, uh, how we set this up. So if, if we do move forward with this, then, then I would insist that uh, those who are hunting outside of deprivation have written permission on their person. Uh, so when they're checked, that our uh, LAs will know that, that they're okay with that. <laughs> Sorry. Commissioner Blue. Just two things. One, if you're following the depredation guidelines during this season, um, no permit would still be required since it's small game, right? Is that correct? Except the hunting license, yeah. Okay, okay. And and then the only other thing I would have is just a statement. I would we would include this still under a sportsman's license. You would still be covered under this, right? If you buy the sportsman's license, this will fall under that as well, right? That's and that's stop shop. And that's one thing we discussed, and, and I, I think probably I may toss it to Tori a little bit there and, and see if he's got any insight on <clears throat> on that thought or process. Uh, it's it's my understanding that the intent of the sportsman, the legislative intent of the sportsman's license, was to be all inclusive. So uh, that's one of the discussion points I think on the on the. The broader picture is, is this something that you all think is appropriate for a permit? If so, we would need to look at creating that permit to coincide 
with the sports season and making sure that we um, promulgate a rule for that revenue stream that comes with the permit. So um, those are the additional components that I think is in the air for y'all's consideration. Mr. Davenport. Thank you, Chairman Gramary. Dale, could you just for our, I guess, enlightenment, have the agency done any research on neighboring states and how they've handled this issue? And if there's been any, you know, problems associated with it? We have, this has been brought up in the past a couple of times and, and there's been some research uh, by our agency. Uh, Colonel Ryder's done a lot of research on it and it's not an easy uh, thing for law enforcement to, um, to delve into because we know there's going to be issues with it. We know we're going to have to uh, have answer more calls or, or, or uh, educate the public a little bit more about it. Uh, surrounding states, um, in our state, we've had a couple of uh, animal shot that should not have been shot at night from people outside of the state thinking that we had a nighttime hunt. And uh, and um, uh, when one case was in Robertson County, someone shot a horse. Uh, so there will be some misidentification uh, associated with this unless people know what they're doing or what they're looking at. I would presume the shotgun would help with some of that mortality that's, though. Correct. Correct. That's what we're thinking. Yes. Thank you. And, and then also a shotgun, uh, would probably be preferable in these areas like, uh, Clarksville. I'm just going by experience. Clarksville has a lot of hunting land in the city limits and, uh, a, a rifle at night there could travel a long ways and you can't see what the background is in a, in a city like that. Mr. Cox. Um, I think the discussion you talked about the, whether the permits covered under sportsman or lifetime, I think it needs to be discussed that it's not. And I'll go further than that, that I think we need to discuss that, that we change what the sportsman's and lifetime licenses cover. You have to grandfather lifetime, but sportsman's license should cover all your licenses. But in my, this is my opinion, but not special permits like duck blinds, presence island, elk, night hunting coyotes, whatever the, the, the optional permits are that everybody doesn't take should not be covered. If you research all the other states that have sportsman's licenses, that none of them cover like Tennessee does. And with our current budget problem, and I hate to harp on money, but that's kind of my job, we need everything we can get as far as income to keep from having to raise licenses prices. So it's it's worth putting on the table and talking about. Thanks. Mr. Wright, just more about the, you know, my intent of my comments about the permit process would be that a small game would not cover, but that you would need a night permit that's associated to purchase that. It's associated with um, a safety video that's required but your sportsman license, based on the way I read the statute, would cover it, whether it be an annual or a lifetime. Um, but it would cause people to buy this nominal price permit. It would also cause people to upgrade to a sportsman. Well, I'm going to do this and additionally, uh, in addition to what I'm doing, I'm going to go ahead and get a sportsman. But that was my intent or my thought process. Any other comments from any commissioners? I think, thank you. Colonel Grant staff, I uh, think we're good. Um, this time, uh, Mark McBride, would you please come to the podium? And, and uh, Mark's going to give us an update on uh, the public comments on all the different issues that we've uh, been talking about. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, so, yeah, at the request, request of the Wildlife Committee yesterday, we just wanted to present a little more about the public input that we got in the the hunting seasons on the CWD unit. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about data as well from over there. Um, so I guess before I show that, I will just give a high level background of what we did. So as part of this adaptive harvest management process, we had these stakeholder groups just kind of identify this whole suite of hunting regulations, packages that were accept acceptable to them if populations were, were getting lower hunting regulation packages that were acceptable if there was a surplus of animals and we could really liberalize harvest. Um, so we took all those draft regulation packages to the public across the state. We had four public meetings. We also live streamed one of those public meetings, um, put it online. 
sent out some public notices and told people, hey, watch this and come give us explicit feedback on, on these questions that we're asking um, and these these packages that we have. So we went out, we did that, you know, by the end of the public comment period, I think we had about 1600 different individuals comment. The total number of comments was over 10,000. Um, and so we were actually able to break some of those comments down by the unit level. And so that's what we did. Um, and I'll show you here. We used an artificial intelligence software to just summarize all those comments to get the high points. So one of the questions we asked is, what do you guys think about a muzzleloader season? You know, we had a we had a package in there that mimicked the CWD regulations as they are currently, where there's no muzzleloader season. There's an extended season. So we asked individuals, what do you think about this package with the muzzleloader season? What do you think about this one without? Um, and so this is Deer Management Unit 1, which is West Tennessee. We had 162 individuals provide comment on those in the summary there. Um, you can see just spits out, told us most respondents supported reinstating a muzzleloader season for all hunting units, including those in CWD zones. Um, and then you can see there's some more bullet points there where some people did like the rifles and they felt it provided more harvest. So we did get that perspective. We know some folks do like it. Um, but overall, you know, kind of in the summary at the bottom there, you see overall there seemed to be more support than opposition for bringing back muzzleloader season across all units, including CWD zones. Um, and again, these are sorted by just those individuals in West Tennessee. So we took this and we said, okay, well, we know there's some differing opinions out there, but most folks would like to see a muzzleloader season back. Um, so we just took that. We wanted to, to use the public input to really drive these final packages, which is why that final CWD package, you know, is not in our, all of our packages and, and all of our deer packages do have a muzzleloader season. Um, we also asked individuals, what do you think about the deer season length? So we had the option in there with a 13 week gun season that would go all the way to the end of January. And you can see here, there was 214 individuals in deer management unit one that commented on this. Um, and again, the majority preferred a moderate to liberal five to seven week gun season. Um, there was some folks that said, yeah, we like the longer gun season. It provides more opportunity. Um, but in the summary there, you know, there's mixed opinions, but many respondents wanted the CWD zone to match the statewide season. So we went out, we got this input. Um, we were obviously concerned from a CWD, the uh, CWD management standpoint, what is this going to do to our harvest? What, you know, we know we need to be shooting as many animals as possible to reduce density over there. That's going to keep the prevalence low, keep the disease from spreading at a faster rate. So we want to make sure that we're managing for CWD. And we were concerned that pulling these regulations back would in fact hamper us managing the disease. There would be less deer killed. So we started looking at the data, what's been going on in unit CWD since all these additional regulations have been happening. And this is just unit CWD since we detected the disease over there. And there's been counties and more liberal regulations kind of added every year. And you can see the, the harvest kind of jumps up and down. It's the last four years or so, it's been about steady around 21, 22,000 animals. Um, but we wanted to delve a little more into it. And so we looked at just the eight core counties. This is really where there's a lot more detections. Um, you know, the core counties of Fayette and Hardeman, where we've got really high prevalence. And we wanted to look kind of before, before the disease was detected and afterwards, um, what is, what are the harvest trends doing? We know there's been a lot of more liberal regulations added since we discovered CWD over there in 2018. And you can see here, there's kind of a, a slow trend. We added um, this previous deer season here and it's kind of leveled out. Um, <clears throat> but the point, one of the things I want to point out is if you look at harvest, you know, 10 years ago or so, it was actually higher than, than anything we see now in these, these eight counties. Um, and so at the request of Commissioner Wright yesterday, he, he pointed out, let's look at Fayette and Hardman, see if that's really that, you know, we know there's a uh, high prevalence of disease there. There's, you know, more and more folks are indicating they're seeing less deer. There might be a disease impact. So those counties might be pulling down that that overall harvest number. Um, so pulling those out, you can see there's there's a definite de definite decline in Fayette and Hardeman. Um, it, it's leveled off a little bit if you look at those trend lines of the four year average, um, but it's it's still down over time. Um, so if we pull out those six remaining counties, 
you can see they they've actually not shown as much of a decline. So there is some indication there that that Fay and Hardeman are are pulling that that unit CWD eight core county harvest down a little bit. Um, but again, if you go back 10 years when there was not nearly as liberal regulations, you still see harvest was a little higher. Um, but at the end of the day, what, what we really needed to know is, are these regulations changing hunters' behaviors? How do we know that hunters are shooting more deer? Um, and so in order to do that, we really wanted to look at how many deer the average hunter is shooting, right? Um, because if, if they're changing their behavior, the average number per deer is Per, per deer hunter is going to go up. Um, and so prior to CWD, hunters were shooting about 1.8 deer per hunter. With all these expanded opportunities, that's jumped to 1.87. So on a whole, hunters are shooting six per, or six one hundredths of a deer more. Um, and we really would like to see hunters shooting one or two deer more across the whole season. Um, so the, you know, long story short, there is is these changes really aren't driving hunting behavior, which is why we went back to the public input and said, OK, this is what we're hearing from the public. We talked to some of our region one staff. You guys are on the ground talking to hunters all the time. What are you hearing? And they're like, yeah, we do hear a lot of guys just want to be like the rest of the state. They they don't want to kind of be singled out with these CWD regulations. Um, and so that's kind of how we ended up with with the packages that we did and we presented yesterday. So I'll, that's just a high level overview. Um, I will add it's 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 clear there's some folks out there that feel strongly um, about the expanded opportunities. So we're going to dig into the data a little more. We're also you know we've posted the the video from yesterday, and we're going to be soliciting input directly on those proposals. So we're going to incorporate you know more data and more input that we get before we present our final you know recommendation in, in April. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Chairman Wright for questions. But I, I had uh, one quick, quick question or, or request. Uh, yesterday, we posted the comment slide and the dates of those comments. Yes, sir. So, sometime during the meeting, just so it's a part of the record for today, could we post that again? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody knows that when the comment period starts and how to how to make those comments. Yes, sir. Commissioner Wright, I just want to quickly thank you, Mark. You know, we just ask you guys with bringing us something tomorrow and it's a lot of data that you have to uh, put together for us. So thank you so much. And same day with you and your team. Um, I think that's all I had, but anybody else on the commission have questions for about that data for more. Oh, I do have one question. One second. Um, and that is if I live in a CWD positive County and I wanted to remove deer in January, how difficult is, is it for me as a landowner to get a CWD permit or a hunting permit or depredation permit in a CWD positive County to do that? So if you're in a, if you're in Fayette and Hardeman, anywhere in Fayette and Hardeman, you can get a management permit. Um, in the other counties, you have to be within three miles of a positive detection to get a CWD management permit. Um, now, if, if you have other depredation issues, we do issue those as well. And that makes sense because in the other counties, they're sparsely populated or low prevalence. So we wouldn't want to be issuing those, you know, just on a whim. Okay. Yes, sir. The idea there is really to, to focus around those outlying detections and just reduce prevalence around those so that the disease does not spread outward from, from that location. Okay. Mr. Box. I just want to add a thank you uh, for you and all your uh, colleagues to sit around a table with your computers with a fish fry going on and <laughs> spend hours working on this. Uh, it means a lot. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Mark, again, uh, for your hard work and your team's hard work. And don't forget, uh, Commissioner Box, there was a uh, NCAA basketball tournament going on as well and the ball and the balls won. So thank you so much. And okay, this time we'll uh, bring Lieutenant Colonel Dale Grandstaff back for a, uh, for a presentation.
Thank you, Commissioner Cranberry. Come on. I'm red, green, colorblind, so it, it's difficult for me up here. <laughs> um, so uh, today we'd like to recognize um, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency 2023 Wildlife Officer of the Year, Officer Ryan Goats. Um, Officer Goats was also picked, uh, chosen as our 2023 uh, CAFWA Officer of the Year representative and went to Corpus Christi, Texas for us uh, back in the fall. Uh, Ryan is currently in Giles County, uh, which is in Region 2, District 22 portion of the state. He went to Giles County High School. After high school, he attended the University of Tennessee at Martin and graduated in 2010 with a degree in natural resource management with a concentration in wildlife biology. Ryan was hired with Tibray in August of 2013 and started his career in Franklin County and then moved to Murray County in the fall of 2014. He recently transferred to Giles County in 2023, the county where he grew up hunting and fishing. Some of his work accomplishments, um, as with all of our officers that were selected from their respective districts, Ryan checked many, many hunters, fishermen, and uh, boaters. He issued a lot of warnings, citations, and good advice when it was needed. He also assisted landowners when asked and worked with other local law enforcement agencies at times. Um, here he is working with Old Caney. Uh, Old Caney keeps uh, surfacing. It was a deer kill down in Murray County and, and that or run over down that area. And uh, they, they took this one again to the governor's mansion this year. It seems to be a popular display for their uh, Christmas uh, display there. Some programs uh, where he really excelled above all others this year, past, uh, past basically everybody else, uh, was his public outreach efforts and programs. Um, these included youth hunts, youth fishing events, speaking with local groups in the community, and hunter, boat, and hunter and boater education classes. Participating in these events and classes, along with numerous school programs, allowed Ryan to contact 11,104 people in Tennessee, uh, many of these contacts being local youth in the community and surrounding areas where Ryan works and lives. Ryan teamed up with the landowners in Murray County, um, landowners in the community for the Tennessee uh, First Shot Group and Hunters for the Hungry to hold two large youth hunts in Murray County. The first hunt was an end of season youth doe hunt with a goal of pairing youth hunters with an experienced mentor on properties with high deer density to assist landowners with deer related problems. This hunt was set up to donate deer to the Hunters for the Hungry program. This hunt saw 70 youth hunters who harvested 35 deer and nine deer were donated to Hunters for the Hungry. Ryan's second youth hunt, Tennessee first shot youth turkey hunt, also in Murray County. This hunt was designated to introduce youth to turkey hunting by also pairing them with an experienced turkey hunting mentor. Several landowners in the area once again donated the use of their land for kids to hunt. This year, 82 kids were signed up and harvested 17 birds, of which seven were first time harvest. Ryan also met with several local groups, including the Columbia River Rotary, Columbia Rotary Club, where he talked about a variety of wildlife-related issues, including Tibray's role in wildlife management in Tennessee. Ryan partnered with the Columbia Police Department in their Community Appreciation Night, where he educated guests on local wildlife and relevant issues. Ryan's hard work and leadership in the community enabled him to assist a local high school class and an industrial company in building wood duck boxes as part of their wildlife management plan on the industrial company's property. Ryan Institute, a library fishing pole checkout program at the Murray County Public Library where people can check out a fishing pole and tackle box, just like a library book, to get outdoors and go fishing. Ryan also partnered with Redneck Blinds and United Farm and Home Co-op to construct two youth handicapped mobile hunting blinds. These blinds are on trailers and are outfitted with fans and heaters. Ryan built these blinds to provide a hunting opportunity in local youth hunt events for youth in wheelchairs to have an easier and more enjoyable experience when hunting. Ryan is currently working to outfit an enclosed trailer with youth archery equipment and targets to further TWA's R3 initiative of recruiting, reactivation, and retaining hunters. Ryan has become a leader in District 22 and in the state, and with his work ethic and forward thinking, and for, the, for those reasons and many more, he was chosen as our 2023 Officer of the Year. Ryan, we appreciate your hard work and your dedication. Uh, to this agency, but most importantly, to the hunters, fishermen, and boaters, and the citizens of Tennessee. Come on up, Brian.
we'll be doing some photos outside at the break. So we'll take those outside. Thank you, Ryan. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks, sir. Recognize Chair Commissioner Butt. I'd like to especially acknowledge Ryan and, and his efforts. I've had the opportunity to work with him for several years since I've been on the commission. And even before that, any time that, uh, that there's been issues and I have called him, he's responded and he had the opportunity to move back to his home County and he's, uh, he's been working several counties in assistance to the agency. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge his hard, hard work and dedication in addition to the acknowledgement of this reward. Thank you, Ryan. Can I, if I may, uh, I do have a couple questions is does it, this man got regular clothes? Cause all he seems to be is a uniform all the time. So, <laughs> so I will do want to recognize his major, uh, Jeff Skelton's back there and also his captain Philip Smith, uh, supporting all his efforts. He's done a tremendous job. So we thank him for that. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Uh, you know, I don't know how you select, uh, one particular officer. I think, it sounds like Ryan is the goat of the, <laughs> to, but we've got so many officers. The list is deep and, and uh, I don't know how you make a selection and pick one out. It's got to be difficult because we've got so many, so many men that are so qualified, but congratulations to you for this year and, and uh, to all the officers that do such a good job. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Little? I'm, I'm, and women, too. I'm terribly sorry. Ron. Just... <laughs> Brian, I, I want, you under, want you to know something, and, and, and I want the officers here to recognize something. As a young man or a young boy, um, my grandfather was a judge in Middle Tennessee in DeKalb County. There was a T three TWRA officers, Mike Foster, Ben Franklin, and Wayne Blair were really good to my little brother and me growing up. Uh, ben Franklin took me smallmouth fishing, crappie fishing, and then carp fishing below the dam at Caney Fort at the Center Hill Dam. He made arrangements for my dad and my grandfather to take my brother and me um, youth deer hunting back in the DeKalb County area. And one of the main reasons that I am sitting here today is because the impact he had on me, or the three of them, but especially Ben Franklin had on me to um, become a young sportsman, young fisherman, young hunter, along with my dad and my grandfathers. And one of the biggest joys I had was last week calling Ben Franklin and telling him that I was going to get to the opportunity to serve on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So I want you to know that there are little boys and little girls out there that are looking up to you and all of you as officers. You have an incredible impact on each of them. And I'm an example of the fact that that impact uh, results in that young man or that young woman maturing, having the opportunity to serve our, our state in this role and other roles. So Ryan, thank you, but to all the officers, thank you for what you do each day. Well said, Commissioner Amen. Ford. Anybody else uh, have a comment? Well, I'm going to apologize to Miss Tone, but uh, I think after breakfast and coffee, we need to take a short break because we want to give you ample time for your fabulous presentation that I know everybody's going to enjoy. So we'll take a 10-minute quick break and, and get back at it here in a minute.
Welcome back. And uh, this time I'd like to introduce Miss Ashley Tone from the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Commissioner Granberry mentioned my name is Ashley Tone and I'm the manager of the Tennessee Scholastic Clay Target Program. Today I'm thrilled to share with you guys some updates about our program and the growth and success we've been seeing and provided some additional information on that Tennessee Wildlife Federation folder you should have all received before the meeting started. But for those of you guys who may not be as familiar with us, I'm with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Our mission is to lead conservation, sound management, and wise use of Tennessee's wildlife and great outdoors. We run several programs, including Hunters for the Hungry, Hunting and Fishing Academy, who you'll hear from later today, and the Tennessee Scholastic Clay Target Program. Tennessee SCTP offers youth ages nine through college the opportunity to compete in trap, skeet, and sporting clays. We currently have 85 teams across the state and have had over 1,600 athletes participate the past few years, making us one of the largest and most successful youth clay target programs in the nation. While we offer a lot of support in the background throughout the season to all of our teams, we do have a few showcase events that we like to show off every year. That includes our state championships that take place every summer at the Nashville Gun Club. Several folks in this room got to experience state last year, including TWRA's own Mr. Matt Cleary, who spent his Saturday grilling free venison burgers and hot dogs for all of our athletes. I'd like to take a moment to invite all of you today to our 2024 state championships, which will happen June 17th through the 22nd at the Nashville Gun Club. Before I get into my presentation, I'd like to give you guys a quick little recap of last year's state championship to show you what is the most exciting week of the year for us. As you can tell, this is a much anticipated event that many of our staff, coaches, and athletes spend the entire year preparing for. We get to celebrate a lot of victories that week, including handing out our brand new Grand Champion State Rings that you see on the screen. But Tennessee Scholastic Clay Target Program is much more about giving athletes the opportunity to win awards and be on the podium. Some may ask, why does Tennessee Wildlife Federation run a youth shooting program? Programs like the Scholastic Clay Target Program are critical to conservation. More Americans participate in target shooting than tennis, baseball, and soccer. And participation is up more than 28% since 2001, according to Southwick Associates. So why is Tennessee SCTP important? Shooting sports are a gateway to the outdoors, and over 67% of our athletes we surveyed state that they started hunting after joining an SCTP team. It promotes firearm safety in a time where firearms are constantly under attack. Statistically speaking, this is one of the safest activities you can participate in, and it's because of our emphasis on firearm safety. And the research is clear. Sport shooters generate just as much, if not more, uh, Pittman Robertson dollars than hunters. It is one of the very few team sports that generates revenue back to conservation. Tennessee SCTP has a few other incidental benefits as well. It is a family and team-based sport where everyone has a place on the team, no matter their size or skill level. Everyone has the same opportunity and there are no bench warmers. It teaches a tremendous amount of responsibility and it promotes academic excellence. Right now in the state of Tennessee, we have four universities that offer shooting scholarships to go to college and pay for their education. The progressive cycle of an athlete's experience is simple. 
Athletes join a team and find friends that enjoy the same activity. These teams then go to competitions and meet other teams with similar interests. Our coaches become mentors to our newer athletes, and the coaches build a network of peers amongst each other. Our older athletes also become mentors to our younger athletes, and these relationships build outside of practice and competition, leading to other activities like hunting and fishing. These mentorships allow the program to be passed on to the next generation when the older athletes age out and coaches retire. After an athlete ages out of our program, our goal is that they continue on an outdoor pathway, enjoying recreational shooting in one way or another. After SCTP, athletes have a few pathways to continue their involvement in shooting sports, competing on the collegiate level, pursuing the Olympics, attending local competition, recreationally shooting with friends and family, coaching, or traveling to nationwide competition. Our program has been around long enough to where we are starting to see alumni coming back as coaches. The first wave of our athletes are now coming back to pass it on to the next generation, and I'm sure we will see more of that to come as many of our early athletes are starting to have families of their own. Today, I have a very special member of our SCTP community with us to share her experiences being a part of this program. Not only is this athlete no stranger to the podium on the state and even the national level, but she is president of her school's HOSA club and Creekwood High School's 2020, 2024 valedictorian. It's been such a full circle experience watching her go from the mentee to the mentor the past few years, and we're all so excited to see her apply the lessons she has learned in Tennessee SCTP to the next few exciting chapters of her life. From the Dixon Clay Commanders, Miss Gabby Worthen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to Ashley and the Federation for letting me come and talk to you guys and speak of what SCTP has done for me and the doors it's opened and all that I, it's given me that I didn't even know existed. Uh, I'm Gabby Worthen, and I know what you're probably thinking, seeing my last name more than and connecting the dots that my dad's all over these programs that I would have had the opportunity and the means to become a hunter or easy entry into shooting sports. But honestly, if you want to see what set me on this path, you wouldn't be what I'd expect. My dad was running SCTP for two years before I ever shot a clay target when I was 12. I dabbled in a couple other sports, some like golf that didn't go so well. Very glad that video is not here before you today. Uh, and others like volleyball and softball that I did excel in, but I was getting pretty competitive and something was missing. I had heard my dad talking to my mom about the programs before. And, and so one day I approached my dad and told him I wanted to quit softball on weekly fishing lessons and start shooting. Dad has never pushed me into anything, including hunting or shooting. Uh, maybe that was his plan all along to make the fire grow. And sometimes us kids don't like to do things that our parents suggest. But either way, he took me to a female coach in the program and to introduce me to the shooting sports. I put my first parachute through and my journey began. Most all kids enjoy hitting targets, but I think there's a few differences in shooting sports that can keep kids into shooting for a long time. First, I enjoyed the opportunity to compete as an individual. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a boy, girl, tall or short or anything. Once you get out there, it's just you and the target. Second, while it's nice to compete on my own merit, I feel part of something bigger. Not only do I have my team, but I have this family where everyone supports you and cheers you on, or that shooting community that Ashley mentioned. Every time I go out shooting on the weekend, I get to see my extended family and see friendships that I get to see from all over the state. Another big piece of the shooting community is mentorship. When I first started shooting for Dixon County, I had one of my teammates, Dakota Duke, who's an amazing shooter. And as a new competitor in the program, I look up to her and it drove me to work harder. She was, she taught me a lot and I had someone I could go to if I needed help or I had a problem. Lastly, and most importantly to me, the sport has given our family an avenue to spend time together outdoors. Going to shoots all over, the part I look most forward to is spending time with my dad and getting to explore these new places with him, making memories that will last forever. Now I'm going to cover a few things that this program has taught me because the sport is more than winning that medal or that buckle. The sport instills values and teaches lessons that kids can't find anywhere else. I learned humility pretty quick to get to stay at national competition and realize just how many kids are there and how good they are. All this, and I knew that I wanted to be on that podium, and I had to make that choice myself. I have learned to focus and fall in love with the process and the road to success rather than the end result. 
you hear coaches say, you don't hear coaches say, you miss more this week than last week. And there's a reason. If you focus on what you're doing and the tricks that work for you, you will see growth rather than what you're doing and how much you're winning. Additionally, the sport has a you reap what you sow philosophy. I had always heard this growing up, but now I get to see firsthand that you get it out as much as you put in. Finally, a critical lesson I have learned is how to handle pressure. It is unlike anything else to be up on the stand shooting in front of a crowd who's watching every movement you make as you shoot off against someone else. It's like the world goes quiet and it's just you and the target. And with more of these experiences, it gets easier to really calm your nerves and only have thoughts about how you are going to crush those targets. I mean, just a few years ago, I would not have wanted to get up here before you today and give this speech. Now that I'm older, I have a new perspective on the sport and what it can do for the youth. The program sets kids up for success as they embark on their adult life, and they understand the importance of putting in the hard work and enjoying the process of struggle to achieve greatness. So thank you, commissioners, for help funding these great programs that truly are making a difference. Thank you, Gabby. So how do we build that sense of community that Gabby talked about to recruit, retain, and reactivate Tennessee SCTP athletes? We see results from promoting extra competitions outside of what we offer. The more we can encourage our athletes to be at the range, the more engaged they are, and the more money they're spending on ammo and targets. Big win for our ranges and for conservation. We also keep up with industry trends. Now we have to be flexible and willing to adapt our program offerings based on what is popular with our current audience and our potential participants. We have learned from survey data from our teams that they want more competition and that sporting clays is gaining traction fast. It has been the fastest growing discipline in our events the last few years. So this year we are offering a sporting clays only competition for the first time, the Bigfoot Blast at Cross Creek Clays. We are also offering glow clays at this competition, which has gone viral on social media and brought excitement to our athletes. We collaborate with other key partners and industry leaders. Most organizations keep their keys to success a secret, but we love to share ours to work together towards a common goal. Our relationships with TWRA, Scholastic Shooting Sports Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, 4-H, and others helps all our programs improve critical to giving more opportunities to our teams and public ranges alike have been key partners to our events and building teams in their area. We focus on the coaches. We know that the coaches are the four multiplier of our program and we have over 500 volunteer coaches across Tennessee. Having their buy-in and support is vital to our program and our job is to train these coaches and give them the confidence to lead their team and recruit others. And last is capacity. Without ranges, we have no program. Ranges are the physical location where teams congregate to build that community. And this is where the agency and the commission play a critical role, building more facilities where more Tennesseans can experience this lifestyle. So what's next? How do we continue to grow? Our plan is to continue to develop new opportunities for athletes to be at the range. We will continue to develop coaches, work with partners, and grow with the program. We plan to add even more competition and work with more ranges across the state. When I was an athlete in the Tennessee SCTP many, many years ago, things were much different. Since I aged out, our program has continued to morph with the athlete in mind. I look forward to being a part of making the Tennessee Scholastic Clay Target Program the biggest and most successful program in the nation and being a part of generating new outdoors men and women in Tennessee. I hope this update helps do you see how great our Tennessee SCTP community is? And with your help, we can continue to provide this community with the best support possible for many years to come. Thank you. Ashley, Gabby, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And uh, it's inspirational to hear what y'all have accomplished and Gabby's success. Uh, it's a uh, 2019, Hank, Tommy, you remember the little uh, young lady from uh, Martin Methodist that had just been selected to the go to the Olympics, and unfortunately, COVID canceled those Olympics in early 2000, so 20, 2020, and so she was not uh, allowed to attend, but we appreciate your accomplishments and everything you guys are doing. Do any other commissioners have any questions for uh, 
Ashley or Gabby? Yeah. Commissioner, hey, uh, Commissioner, I really don't have a question, but I would just say, like to say as the commissioner, this has probably been one of the most successful programs I think that we have helped with over the years. It's unbelievable. We have anywhere from 50 to 80 kids that participate in it in Henry County uh, every year. A gentleman in the back, Mr. Lance Ryder back there is the one who helped get that program going. Uh, he got me into it, Lance, and when Lacey was shooting um, – and uh, it's been going ever since. I got to be a, a big part of it and loved it, and it's still growing and getting bigger every year. I saw this on the agenda, and I'm kind of like you. I've been out of the game for several, several years. I've got a state championship belt buckle, and I was going to wear it today, uh, but the belt didn't fit for some <laughs> reason. I don't, it's like, dang it. So I've got to get another belt, but I still got the buckle. So thank you for what you all do. Commissioner. But... <clears throat> I would just like to acknowledge uh, Ashley and her efforts and, and with her background and, and knowing her story. If many of you haven't heard that, then she's an outstanding person to represent the, the program uh, and to relate to other kids who were in other sports that things happened to them that they weren't able to excel or continue. And so I'm grateful that, that, uh, the Federation has Ashley and the great job that she does in the presentations that you make. And I thank you for that. And Gabby, I think you did an outstanding job. Mr. Cox. Over the years, Tennessee has been in the top nationally, national champions, maybe in the top five in most of the competitions. Can you tell us where we are now as far as nationally ranked? Do you have that with you? Yes, sir. So last year we brought home 77 national titles and that was the second highest out of any state. Georgia beat us by just a few, um, but consistently we are in the top five for both medals received and participation in terms of number of athletes as well. Aren't we, aren't we uh, number one in, in one particular discipline and like third or fourth in two the one thing about our program is there's a lot of other states that focus on one particular discipline, like Iowa and Wisconsin. They're really tra heavy trap, and Georgia is heavy sporting clays. If you look at our breakdown of the national titles our athletes have won, they're consistent across the board, and they're winning in all of the events. So I would say the overall, but we're gaining recognition in sporting clays pretty quick. Um but it's, it's pretty consistent on all the different disciplines offered. Well, it's a great, great program. Thank you. Uh, just one final point. Uh, Commissioner Box and I have a lot of fun uh, teasing President Randy Boyd up at UT <laughs> and reminding him that since he's been president, there's only been two national cha championships under his leadership, and both of them were sporting clay at UT Southern. So we uh, yeah. want that spread across the minutes and – and make sure, and he he proudly wears a hat that I had made for him that denotes the 2022 national champions in sporting clays at UT Southern. So thank you very much, Ashley and Gabby. We appreciate it. Okay, we'll keep this consistent. We'll stay with the Federation. Mr. Jeb Beasley, would you please come to the podium? this on hey can you hear me all right yeah, good morning commissioners my name is jeb beasley i'm the manager for the hunting and fishing academy here at tennessee wildlife federation uh, we're really grateful to be able to be here to give you an update on the work that our hunting and fishing academy has accomplished over the past couple of years i know it's been a minute since we've given you an update so really excited to share with you how this program has grown and um, some of the different things that we've been learning through this process as well I know some of you are more familiar with our work than others. Uh, some of you have even hosted events on your property. Commissioner Woods, Commissioner Childress, y'all both come to mind, and we greatly appreciate the support that you show our program. Uh, but I know we have a lot, a lot of new commissioners also. So before I jump into the nitty-gritty of what this program looks like, I want to make sure that I give you some good background information so you understand why this program exists in the first place and what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, and one thing I'll ask as I go through this presentation is pay careful attention to the imagery that you'll see on the screen because all these pictures were taken 
at actual hunting and fishing academy events with real participants and real um, volunteers. So what is the problem that we're trying to address? Why does this program exist in the first place? Uh, like you've heard us talk about a couple times already this morning, hunters are the ones that are contributing to most of the conservation efforts that's taking place across the country. Um, but the national studies show that the national hunting participation has been in a slow, steady decline for many years now. And it took us a long time to get to the point where we are today. And it's going to take a long time to try to reverse this trend. Um, and that's where programs like ours come in to help address this issue. There's a national movement called R3, which we've already talked about, which stands for Recruitment, Retention, and Reactivation of Hunters and Anglers Across the Landscape to address the decline in, in um, hunting and fishing participation. And so that's where programs like the Hunting and Fishing Academy come into play. Uh, so what is the Hunting and Fishing Academy? We are just an educational R3 program that exists to create new hunters and anglers here in the state of Tennessee. And how do we fit into that problem of addressing the declines in hunting participation? Well, one way to think about it is that this is an investment with compounding effects. So each year we're bringing in new participants that are learning how to hunt and fish, but we're also making efforts to help keep them here and to help keep them engaged and participating through time. So that next year we retain those folks and then we also bring in new participants, new, new hunters and anglers as well. So that you can see through time when we retain and recruit over and over again, it helps us have a compounding effect that will have lasting benefits um, for years to come. Uh, now, this program does live under the umbrella of the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, but it was built in direct partnership with the agency. Uh, we started as a small pilot program in 2015. Uh, but here a few five years ago in 2019, we started an official uh, partnership with the commission and with the agency uh, to fund this program and to really see what this can do across the landscape. And again, our mission is just to retain or to recruit, retain and reactivate hunters in Tennessee. We want to provide safe, educational and memorable outdoor experiences. So some of our recurring goals each year, we want to teach safe hunting practices we want to provide our participants with a variety of educational opportunities. We want to help them grow in their skills, their knowledge, and their confidence towards hunting and fishing. And we want to help them take their next step um, in feeling like they belong to, you know, the greater community of hunters and anglers in the state. And that's a big theme that we're going to touch on uh, a little bit later. Um, and again, each of the each of these things that we're doing is again going back to those R three prin principles to recruit retain and reactivate um, hunters and anglers on the landscape. And how do we do this? There's three main pathways that people can engage with our program. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into what each of those looks like, but if you have questions on those, I would be really happy to uh, address those at the end. But those three pathways and how we accomplish our mission is we teach virtual classes, we provide youth and family experiences, and then we also offer workshops for our adult audience to come out and to learn these new skills um, that they're going to need to be successful in the field. Each of those, again, is a way for us to recruit, retain, and reactivate. So what have we learned through this process? We've been running this program for a few years now. What are some of the big things that we've been learning? Well, I'm going to share four things with you today, and the first one is diverse offerings. We know that not everybody has the same schedule. Not everybody even has the same interest when it comes to learning how to hunt. So that's why we strive to provide a variety of different opportunities. We teach virtual classes as well as providing in-person experiences so that people have different avenues that they can interact. They can learn new and different things. Some of those events range from, you know, just a couple hours to some are a full weekend experience. Um, and it's our hope that by providing those different opportunities, that we can expand our reach and bring even more people in uh, to this community that we're trying to help create. The second one is progression. Uh, from the research that's been done, we've known that you can't necessarily create a new hunter with a one and done type of experience. We want to make sure that we're helping these people get past that stage of initial exposure to learning how to hunt. We want to help them um, progress. And one of the things that we do to, to try and accomplish that is we ask people, well, what are your end goals? How can we help you accomplish your, your end goal to get to where you want to be? And when we survey our participants, the answers are they're kind of all over the place. About 10 of 10 percent of them said we need you to cover more basic material. Some of this stuff you're talking about, it's going over our head. Well, another 26 percent of them said 
we want to cover more advanced material during these classes. We want to take those bigger next steps to actually learn how to do this on the landscape. And then another 36% of them said, well, we've never done this at all. So we have no idea where to even start. What's our even, what's our first step. And so when you get all these different answers and you have people with different starting points and different end goals, well, what does that mean for us as the ones that's trying to run this program? Well, it means we have to help people build in stepping stones to help them reach their goal. We can't expect everybody to come to the same event and learn everything that they need to learn in one go. We are trying to build in stepping stones for people to take those logical next steps. So what that looks like is um, some of our beginner workshops, we might cover uh, just information on hunting regulations, how to find public access, how to buy your license. Why do you have to buy a license? Um, we've learned not to assume anything. So we start with the basics and make sure that people understand that before we move up to those higher level skills of learning how to scout and applying the knowledge uh, that they're going to need to go out and actually be successful in the field uh, with the end goal that hopefully they would continue to do these things on their own at one point. Um, so that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have a long lasting impact on their learning in a way that's going to be effective. And that kind of leads right into the third one is the science of learning. We're focusing on what we teach. Yes, that's important. But how we're teaching that is just as important, if not more so. Uh, we're learning that we've got to be very intentional with how we communicate with these new hunters so that they understand not just how to go out and do these things, but why we do them in a certain way. Uh, and we've tried to build this program with the end goal in mind. And then we work backwards to create steps that help us get there and achieve those goals. Um, and so some of the things that we've been trying to do is, is make sure we're asking our participants, how can we help you be successful? Uh, we focus on the learning outcomes. So we want to make sure that we know what they want to know. But then we're also focusing on how to be better teachers. Are we using research based practices to transfer information? Or are we just showing them how to do it and hoping they understand? Um, and then we put heavy emphasis on the assessment part of this program. We build in all kinds of different surveys and assessments to make sure that we're being effective at communicating and accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so far, um, when you look at, well, we looked at one study that showed that out of 500 different outdoor education programs, only a quarter of them are even keeping track of who came to these events and only 10% are providing some kind of post event survey or follow up resource. And that's one of the areas that we try to put heavy emphasis on is we have a detailed record of everybody that came to these events so that we can track their participation through time. And then we also provide them with a pre and a post event survey in class assessments to make sure that we're being attentive and we're taking this work uh, very seriously. Um, and again, going back to some of our goals, we want to make sure that we're helping them increase their knowledge and skills. And so far, 98 percent of our participants said that this program was effective at helping them increase their knowledge and skills and making them feel more confident when they go out on the landscape to hunt. And then the last one I'll touch on is community. Uh, we, we know that from what we've observed, social support is going to be one of the most crucial factors to making sure we keep these people engaged. If they don't feel like they belong to the community of hunters and anglers in the state, and they don't feel like they have people around them to support them as they're learning how to do these things for the first time, well, the likelihood of them continuing to do this outside of our program is going to decrease pretty drastically. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're putting emphasis on making them feel connected, making them feel like they are um, aware of different opportunities and they're aware of these relationship building opportunities. Uh, and again, so far, when we ask our participants, are we doing a good job at that? 96 percent of them said that we were effective at connecting them with other hunters in the state. But we view this as a big opportunity for us to grow going forward. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. So when you put all that together, yes, it helps us monitor. Are we being effective? Are we making a difference? But it also helps us increase our capacity with what we're able to do. So as we've added new layers to this program each year, you can see that it has a direct impact on how many people we're allowed uh, to reach each year. So going back to that far bar on the far left, that is the last year before we entered into our official partnership with the agency and the commission. Um, the, the three blue bars in the middle reflect the growth through our first grant cycle, which was a three year grant. Um, and then the most uh, recent grant that we're currently in are these two green bars on the far right. Um, you'll see last year that we finished with almost 8,000 total participants. And as of the middle of this month, we're sitting right there at about 4,400 total participants. We've got a lot of events planned for the rest of this spring and summer. And we're expecting that to take a big uptick to finish somewhere close to where we were last year. 
the big takeaway here is that we've grown a lot in a short amount of time. Our influence has gone from just a couple hundred people a year to we're working with several thousand people across the state now. Uh, and again, that's in direct correlation with the investment that you put in this program. We've been fortunate to build it out um, and to make these bigger impacts um, throughout um, each year that we run it. So all that being said, where do we see our biggest opportunities for growth going forward? We're, we're doing a lot of stuff on the landscape, but kind of what, what comes next for us? Um, and the first big one that I'm going to touch on is our volunteer network. The volunteers that help us run this program, uh, we, we could not do this work without them. Some of you, Commissioner Woods, that you have seen what it takes to run some of these events, it's, it's too much for just our staff members to do it. And our volunteers help us with the planning, the logistics. They are acting as our instructors and our mentors for all the people that are coming through this program. And we need more volunteers. Uh, we need to put more effort into recruiting and training our volunteers. And that's why we're planning to hopefully add an additional staff member that will focus just on retain or recruiting and training these volunteers so that we can meet the needs of this big growth we've already experienced but that we can also help prepare for the growth that we think is coming here in the next few years. Um, the second one is going to be hunting and shooting opportunities for adults. When I first started with the Federation, we focused solely on youth and their parents. Then we slowly added in the virtual classes until we got to where we are today, where we have learning opportunities that we're hearing from them when they come to our training workshops is that we're really hungry to go out and actually go hunting as part of this program. We want to go out and hunt, but I don't know if I'm, ready to take that step on my own. And so we want to give them the opportunity that they can come out to one of our events and actually go hunting uh, to put to practice the skills that they're learning in other areas of this program. And that includes some additional firearms training with the rifles and the shotguns and the archery equipment that they might be using. We want to make sure that they're confident. So we're going to be working with a lot of our ranges across the state to try to provide more opportunities to get people out there to apply the skills that they need to know. Um, and that application piece, that's crucial in learning any new skill. We got to help make sure that we're letting them apply these, these skills that they're learning in other areas. Um, and again, that, that's our hope is that we can provide more spaces for that to happen. And then we want to help our participants build a community. We've talked about that already, but this is perhaps the most important part of all the different work that we're doing across the state. Again, if these people don't feel like they belong, well, we run the risk of just being a drive through program that they come to when they need to fill a quick outdoor craving. And that's not what we want to be. We want to be a lasting support network that supplies resources, that helps them build relationships, that gets them involved in new ways outside of just interacting with us through a virtual class or coming to a workshop. We want to help them feel like they belong to our program but that they also belong to the greater community of hunters and anglers across the state. And um, that's something that our staff is being very attentive to. We're going to put a lot of effort into trying to build that community out more this year. Maybe that looks like running some different types of events or something along those lines, but we're going to put pretty heavy emphasis on creating uh, or trying to create that community aspect of the program. And then lastly, I just, again, we're, we're going to try to build on our continued partnerships. These are just a few of the groups that we work with. Obviously, the agency has a heavy hand in all the work that we're doing. We couldn't do this without their support and yours. Um, and we're just one piece of this R3 puzzle here in the state of Tennessee. There's lots of other groups that are doing similar things, um, but we're, we're trying to make sure that we're working with other folks that we can make this R3 movement um, effective and long lasting here in the state of Tennessee. All right. I know that was a lot of information rather quick, uh, but the big takeaway here is that we are trying to be very deliberate in making this program better. Uh, we're very passionate about the work that you all allow us to do, and we take it very seriously. Um, when you talk to the people at the national level that are working in R3 all across the country, uh, one of the things that we've heard from them is there's not a lot of other programs out there that are doing what we do at the scale at which we do it. Um, and again, that's not possible without y'all's trust in us to go out and accomplish all this good work. Uh, later on this spring, come May, we're going to be at the National R3 Conference. We've been invited to share a little bit more about how we've structured this program, um, what our goals are and what, what we're trying to do on the landscape here in Tennessee. And we view that as a great opportunity um, to share the investment that you all have, have poured into us so that we can continue to pour into other people as well. Um, so again, I know that was a lot really quick, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer those at this time. 
to those questions. But um, a lot of it early on when people are coming in, the, some of the biggest barriers that they feel in terms of feeling connected to this community, it's something as basic as the terminology, right? They don't understand the language of what we're talking about. So that's one of the things that it sounds kind of silly, but we throw around terms when it comes to, you know, different things about hunting. We say the rut. Well, somebody that's not deer hunted before, they don't know what there is. So we got to help make sure that they understand the terminology, but also we got to make sure that they understand what resources are already out there to help them continue to learn how to do these things. Another piece of it is a lot of these new hunters, they don't understand that we have all this different public land across the state that's there for them to utilize. Uh, and so that's a big focus of what we try to address as well is making them aware that, hey, there's opportunities outside of just where we're taking you to go do this that you can continue to engage. So we push our public lands pretty heavy just to make sure people are aware that it's an opportunity. Um, and then again, just trying to provide them with as many resources as we can after the fact to make them feel like they're, they're still confident to go do this stuff. Great. I think the SCTP program is great. And, but this, this mentor program is, is one of the best I've ever seen. If not the best, this effort, I think it's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you again, Jeb. We appreciate everything you and the Federation do and, and our partnership and look forward to many, many more years of success. Absolutely. And, and I'll say again, before I leave, uh, we would love for you guys to come out and see what these events look like. Some of you I know have hosted events and uh, we, we would love to have y'all come out and, and see what this looks like on the landscape and interact with our participants. So you'll see on that one pager, there's some of our staff members on there in different parts of the state. Um, if you ever have questions, we'd be happy to have you out. Thank you so much. That's a, a really nice segue into uh, Commissioner Cox reminding me our June meeting in Nashville is the Friday before the state championship at the gun club. So everybody make plans and uh, stay over that Friday night and participate. I know Commissioner Davenport and Commissioner Cox and I were out there last year and Charlotte even came. So we all had a good time at the, uh, at the shoot and it was wonderful to experience it. So this time I'd uh, like to ask, uh, Mike Bell, former Senator Mike Bell, who's now our government liaison. And and I think everybody on this commission will say that under commission, former Chair Box and former Chair Woods, we've really ramped up our communication program with Emily's professional expertise. And so Mike's uh, communication along with uh, General Counsel Grimes have, have really helped this commission stay in touch with what's going on at the legislature. And uh, so, Mike, I'll turn it over to you, and we appreciate a update as a, sesh, as a session comes to a, a, a close to a close. Thank you, Chairman Granberry. And um, before I get them to the legislative update, I want to mention something that I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, maybe even a little bit longer ago than that, maybe a month ago. There's going to be a breakfast. It's not being put on by us. You know, we had a legislative breakfast about a month ago. But it's being put on by the uh, Sportsman's Caucus next Thursday uh, from 7.30 to 8.30 at the Cordell Hall building. Any commissioners who are in town or want to make a trip uh, to come in town for that breakfast, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a good event. We're going to have uh, Joe and Mark give, us, give the legislators an update on the new uh, proposed deer and turkey management plan. And I think they're going to vote on, um, on new leadership and – just get together and talk. So again, any commissioners who uh, would like to come to that, uh, you can let me know and uh, I can make sure that we save a seat for you and that you recognize when you come to that breakfast. Is currently Mike, uh, Bob uh, Freeman, chairman of that sports <clears throat> caucus? It's, it's Bob Freeman and Senator Paul Rose. Okay. And now they will elect new leadership. And what they hope to do at this meeting is to elect uh, two co-chairs from each each uh, house, each body. So there'll be two two House members and two senators who will act as chairman. And, and Miss Mary, will you please send an invite out to all the commissioners so we'll get that on our calendars? And thanks okay. for that, Mike. All right, you're welcome. Well, we do have a legislative update and, and kind of give you an overview. We're probably you know, best best guess probably somewhere around five or six weeks uh, to the end of session, and uh, with with um, getting. Toward the end, we've already seen the Senate Energy and Ag Committee close, which most of our issues go through that committee in the Senate. Uh, there's still a, uh, a couple committees in the House open uh, where our issues move through, and we still have, I believe, a couple bills that could be heard in Senate Judiciary that would impact the agency. That's just kind of an overview about where we're at, and I'm going to get into a couple specific uh, bills that we've 
been working on in, in one way or another. The first one is a bill that we actually brought. Uh, it was It's on um, the issue that we discussed here, I think, a couple different times on uh, what happened during the snowstorm at the marina on Fort Loudon Lake, where you had the uh, marina uh, get heavily damaged by snow, and the director and the agency had no authority to grant a no-wake zone immediately, where they get in, they get in there and start con- uh, start the construction, start repairing that marina. And so what this bill will do uh, when it passes, it's passed the Senate, it's moving through the House, expect it to pass the House. It'll allow the director, under certain circumstances, to uh, be able to grant a no-wake zone immediately. Now, we'll still have to go through the emergency rule process, and that's the normal process for doing a no-wake zone um, through the emergency rule and the regular rule process, but this will give the director at his discretion the authority to grant a no-wake zone for specific circumstances like what happened on the the, um, uh, Fort Loudon Lake at the marina. Any... I, I guess I could stop on each one of these if you have any questions, and then we can go on to the next one. Any questions on that one? Seeing none, I'll move on to the next bill. The next one is also one that, that we brought. Uh, in a comptroller audit last year, uh, the, the comptroller said that um, the language uh, in the statute that gave us the authority to, to contract with vendors at our agency lakes and agency properties was a little unclear. In fact, he even questioned whether we had the authority to contract vendors. And so uh, uh, General Counsel Grimes, uh, he drafted a piece of legislation uh, at the at this comptroller's suggestion that we go in and clarify this language, basically that we have the authority to do what we've been doing for 50 years. And so that's what this bill does. It, uh, it just clarifies that we have that authority to, to contract with vendors. It also um, clarifies an issue that came to light while we've been dealing with um, falconry and exotic animals over the last couple of years that you uh, only need a propagation permit and not both a propagation and possession permit if you are propagating animals. In other words, if you're propagating animals, it's assumed you're possessing animals. So why why require you to have two permits? So that's what that bill does. It has passed the Senate already and also moving through the House. Shouldn't be any problem with that bill as well. Any questions on that one before I go forward? Seeing none, I'll go to the next bill. The next bill... This is kind of the, this, is, this one's been, had some um, um, uh, a little humorous moments with it. We're just changing poisonous to venomous when it talks about snakes. So snakes are not poisonous. Poison is something that's absorbed or inhaled or, or, um, or, or taken orally. Venomous is injected. And so this is just an incorrect language that's been in statute for, I think, 70 years, Tori. I believe it's been... It's been about 70 years, and all this bill does, and everybody thought it was a caption bill. Everybody said, what are you really doing with this bill? I said, no, we're really just changing poisonous to venomous. And, and so that's all the bill does. Any questions on that one? All right. <clears throat> Next bill. Uh, this is the wetlands bill. Uh, this is one that many of you have heard a, a lot about. Uh, it's, it's a bill that... Uh, uh, potentially uh, could put about a half a million acres of wetlands on private property in danger uh, to be uh, developed or otherwise altered. Uh, The bill has um, been deferred to summer study in the Senate. It is still moving in the House. There's still talk that the Senate could possibly reopen the Energy and Ag Committee. It would have, that committee would have to be reopened for this bill to be heard. Uh, so there's talk that the committee could be reopened for uh, a couple other bills and that maybe this one could be put on the calendar. I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I think my our partners with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, who also uh, do a great job in helping us with issues in Nashville, uh, we've talked with them and, and other people who have been watching this bill uh, very closely. I can tell you our our best um, guess and our, 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 I think the, conventional wisdom would say this bill doesn't get um, heard in the Senate. Uh, and, and so then it doesn't really matter if it passes the House floor because it, unless it passes both bodies, it doesn't become law. Uh, but it is, it is one uh, that we're watching. Uh, of course, it's, it's mainly impacts TDEC and uh, TDEC has been the lead agency in, in um, negotiating with the sponsor. And, uh, and I'm sure they'll continue to do that. 
and continue to work on it. And uh, the Senate, sometimes a summer study, you'll hear this, uh, you'll hear this phrase used in the legislature, and sometimes it's a throwaway. When something's sent to summer study, it's a way to kill a bill without wanting to deal with it. But this uh, summer study motion in the Senate Energy and Ag Committee was for a true summer study. So that means this summer there'll be committee meetings on this issue where, where they'll call uh, the different agencies and we'll be one of them that could be impacted by this and ask us to come together and hopefully work out a solution on this bill going forward. So any questions on that one? All right, we'll go to the next one. All right, this one, this is a, uh, this is a bill on search and seizure. Y'all all know that we're, um, we're under this um, lower court ruling on the rainwater case that's kind of constricted our movement on private property. Uh, Tori, it was June 26, so it's been almost nine months since the appellate court heard uh, arguments on uh, this case, and we've still not got a, uh, a decision on it. It could come any day. It could come this morning. It could come today. Uh, at nine months, we're decision. Uh, usually, they they're given within four to six months. What this bill sought to do is codify the lower court ruling, essentially codify the lower court ruling. And uh, we would much prefer to let this play out in the courts and see what kind of decision we're going to get out of the courts. It's we, it's it's fun to sit around a, a table and talk about what could happen. And we've got a couple of attorneys on the commission, and you can guess all day what the appellate courts may or may not do with the case. And uh, we still don't know what will happen there, but we know we don't want the legislature jumping in front and codifying uh, what this lower court said without the appellate court or possibly even the Supreme Court, uh, which I guess it will probably go there, uh, setting some guidelines on, on this issue. But um, this bill was, was uh, deferred in the House. It was actually uh, rolled to the last calendar of the year, hoping that maybe the appellate decision would come down sometime between now and the end of session. Uh, and in the Senate, it's not been put on notice. And I talked to the Senate uh, Judiciary researcher last week, and he said the sponsor had not even asked it to be put on notice. So he didn't think it would even be heard this year. So that's that's uh, that's where that bill is in is at right now. Um, again, I've said a lot, but my best guess is that bill will not be heard this year. Any questions? Yes. I know we've got two attorneys here. Well, they're a lot sharper than I am, but. Does not the Fourth Amendment covers all those rights anyway? So what what difference does it make if we pass a state law on it or not? I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Tory weigh in on that one. It's <laughs> actually three, Tom. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right, Tory. Dang it, I forgot. My bad. Oh, that's right, Tory can't say anything. I better not say anything either. <laughs> well. Uh, I think I can probably say that there is certain nuance to that, but beyond that, it we probably can't speak because it is subject to active litigation. Typical answer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I tell you what, I won't ask for more questions. I won't ask for more questions on that one. We'll just go ahead. <laughs> Move, moving along. All right, all right. The, the next, the next one is uh, the uh, the baiting bill. And if y'all, if you followed this one earlier in the year, uh, in fact, um, even from last year, you remember we had a very similar bill last year that got that got constitutionally rejected on the Senate floor. Now, what that means, it received a majority of no votes. Uh, you know, I, I served, I served sixteen years in the General Assembly. I think I saw a bill receive the majority of no votes fewer than a half a dozen times in sixteen years. Uh, I never saw one rejected. Now in the in the house it's a different procedure. If it receives a majority of no votes, they have to follow that up with a motion of rejection in order for it to be rejected. In the Senate, if it receives a majority of no votes, it's automatically rejected. So when this bill was filed back in um December, uh, I um yeah, I immediately thought that bill can't be heard. And it took the the chief clerk of the Senate is very deliberate. Uh, he's an attorney, and uh, it took him a couple months to finally make his decision, but he decided that the bill could not be heard because uh, it was too similar or very similar to the bill that was rejected last year. And what the, what the Constitution says is if, 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 a, um, if, a, if a bill is rejected, then that caption of where that bill came from in statute is closed 
for that two year general assembly. And so that this bill we didn't have to deal with, not because of any work we did this year. Um, we we didn't have to deal with it because it was rejected last year. The next one is the um, Jones Campbell bill. It was one that would have prohibited or outlawed hunting sandhill cranes. Uh, that one was never heard in either the House or the Senate. And those committees are closed. So that's one we'll not have to worry about either. Any questions on these before we move forward? Is Representative Ritchie, uh, will he be back next year? He is running for the Senate. Uh -oh. So he won't be back in the House. He's running for the Senate. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next one. This is uh, uh, the, the Rose Hemmer bill. It would have increased fines and penalties on um, removing or poaching while trespassing. It's not our bill. It was one that we generally supported. It ran into some some political issues. I'll just put it that way. It uh, um, it it, it kind of got pushed to the end of the uh, calendar in the Senate, and um, for one reason or another. Uh, the uh, the chairman of the Senate Energy and Ag Committee, uh, he decided he didn't want to see that bill move forward, so it did not move forward. Uh, the next one is, and this one is is a bill that um, I, I actually thought was probably one of the most, from a philosophical standpoint, dangerous bills that we had this year, and it would have required restitution to be paid to the landowner for poaching an animal. Now, what does that do? That completely strikes at the very heart of the North American wildlife management model, that uh, game belongs to the people. Game belongs to all the people, and it's held in trust, uh, you know, by by the agency. And um, and this bill, this bill came from a very specific uh, situation that happened with Senator Bowling, and, and uh, General Counsel Grimes was able to go in and sit down and talk to her and uh, uh, find out uh, what happened and and uh, he will, he and we all will be kind of working with her to address that situation and hopefully can take care of that. Uh, so this bill was not heard in either the House or the Senate as well. But again, I, I thought it was very dangerous in that it was it was paying the landowner uh, for for game, for the value of game taken off their property. Any questions on that one? All right. The next one, uh, the Warner Hensley bill. This one is a bill that requires us to give a uh, free waterfowl license to duck hunters, uh, veteran duck hunters. Uh, this bill is has passed the Senate. Now, it's got a fiscal note or fiscal impact of $39,000. And in the Senate, they have what's called a sweeper. And in fact, any, any bill with a fiscal impact of below $50,000 is automatically swept up and paid. That's what the sweeper means. So it's included in the Senate budget. House doesn't have that. So this bill is been put in a procedural place called behind the budget in the house and waiting to see if it'll get funded. Um, we're, we're good with it because of a bill that passed in 2017 that requires the general assembly to fund any future discounts or free license that are given. It requires them to fund it out of the general fund. So we don't have to eat it prior to 2017. When the general assembly passed on these bills, the agency had to eat that cost. We don't have to eat that anymore with the passage of that bill. And so that's why when we've been asked our opinion on this bill, we, we've said we'll defer to the General Assembly and whatever y'all prefer to do, you want to give us some money to pay for it, we're happy to carry out your wishes. Uh, the next one is the uh, Rose Darby bill. It was actually brought by the by our partners in the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. And... Um, it's happened. There's been a number of states and a couple come to my mind, Washington, Colorado, uh, Maryland and the eastern United States, where you've seen governors put people on wildlife commissions who are hostile to wildlife management, hostile to using hunting and fishing as wildlife management. And this was kind of a preemptive bill uh, that that makes sure that that attempts to make as we go forward, make sure that the kind of people who serve on the commission are people who are active in the in the activities that you regulate hunting fishing boating um, even ohv use but it's 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 things that we regulate we want to make sure that the, they wanted to make sure said we i'm sorry they wanted to make sure in this in drafting this bill that the people who sit on the, are active in the in the um activities that that the commission regulates and uh, and also uh, making sure that uh, that uh, uh, you know hunting and fishing are the preferred method of wildlife management uh, going forward as well, and that decisions are based on science 
as well. It was, uh, again, it wasn't our bill, but a bill that, uh, that we watched and, um, I'm not supposed to have personal opinions, but personal opinion, I think it's a good bill. And that's it. Uh, any any questions, further questions, uh, Chairman Granberry? Anybody have any questions for Mike? Mike, we appreciate it. We appreciate you and Tori, and we left out Assistant General Counsel Daniel Cox. Absolutely. And, and Emily and the entire team, I think, uh, I speak for myself, we're, we're much better aware of what's going on in, in the legislature and, and all across the state. And it, it helps us do our jobs and we appreciate your efforts and, okay. and uh, we thank you for that uh, presentation. All right. So I'll uh, jump right into uh, commissioner Cox and the uh, budget committee. Thank you. <coughs> Frank. Oh, you go. Kent. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a either a two-page report or several slide report, if you will refer to to either one that is to your liking. I'm reporting through the month financially through the month of January, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the boating fund is uh, the first slide, and we are uh, at almost uh, a break-even point with our projection for the year, slightly behind at 78,000 in our boat registrations. Uh, our expense to budget percent is approximately 32% in boating. And the next slide uh, is the wildlife slide. And we're ahead in our projection by uh, over a million six through January. Our expense to budget through uh, the, the appropriate or through January is uh, 40%. And the next slide is the wetlands acquisition fund. We have approximately $20 million balance in it. And then the last slide is our um, investment, uh, endowment investment and our reserve balances. And uh, I would note that our SPIF fund, which is our state, food, state pool investment fund, is currently at 5.35%. Any questions, comments? Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Frank, I don't think, unless somebody has a question about something we saw yesterday, I don't think Frank needs to represent the information. Does anybody have any questions for Frank? I would like to You've ask got, for a friendly amendment. Yep. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, you go ahead and ask that. Okay. So yesterday I presented a piece of data that was inaccurate. Uh, I'll show you on this slide here for the hunt fish Academy. We intended to fund it at 598. I applied a match calculation to it again, which reduced it in what I showed you here. It should have been 598. Again, this, uh, this project is 100% matched by the, the Federation. So there's no, no further impact to the reserve. That that's the amendment that I would ask for the. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, the, the budget committee voted and recommended approval of what was presented yesterday. And uh, I'll, would you take up the amendment? Thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Chairman Cox. So you've seen the amended, uh, Budget expansion requested by uh, Frank, and and as amended, I'll take a motion to approve the budget expansion as amended. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Cox. I have second. Second. Second by Commissioner Ballou. Any further questions or discussion? Frank, I'll ask one question. The the amount that goes back in the positive amount at the end that's not impacted at all either. That, that that's not no. It didn't increase accordingly. It it no because this fund this project didn't um, neither did it get reimbursed from two different funds nor did it take state dollars to okay. do it. So okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we have a amendment a budget as a, a expansion as a, as amended and we have a motion a second. There are any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Expansion passes, Frank. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chairman Cox, for your work on this budget. It's thank a you, Chairman. very important part of this program. So brings us close to the end. I have a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, well, number one, we'll see everybody next month in Johnson City, uh, the 18th and the 19th. Uh, and uh, if 
y'all put the slide up on the information relative to comments. So there's the slide for the record. So if you have any comments on all the stuff we talked about relative to uh, the season setting, there's a slide for the public. So we appreciate your comments by, well, it just keeps jumping around. Here we go. There was, well, there it is. So there's the slide. And um, one final note, thank you. And uh, annual reports are on the table if everybody wants to take some for their coffee tables and give out to their friends. And also uh, it's online and I've sent that link out to everybody. And that being any further business by the director, any commissioners have any further comments? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>